Hello, my name is Georgia Mew. I work for the Bureau of Oceans, Environment, and Science at the U.S. Department of State, and I want to welcome you to the U.S. Center. This is our last day, but we're really happy that you're here. Um, if you don't know, the U.S. Center is a public diplomacy initiative um, organized by the Department of State, and we've been doing this since Copenhagen. We plan to keep doing this into Paris in 2015 and onward, so thanks for being here today. Um, <laughs> We have a, a great presentation for you. Uh, right now, it's the aerosols and black carbon in a changing climate. Uh, our presenter is Dr. Bruce Doddridge. He is the head of chemistry and dynamics branch at the science directorate at NASA Langley Research Center in Hampton, Virginia. His responsibilities include formulating and developing research programs and managing both technical and administrative aspects of these programs in support of the NASA Science Mission Directorate. He holds an adjunct faculty position at the rank of full professor in the Department of Atmospheric and Ocean Science, Oceanic Science at the University of Maryland in College Park. And he received his PhD in chemistry uh, from the University of Adelaide in, uh, in South Australia. So that just goes to show if you can be from anywhere and go on to become a, a NASA scientist. So without any further ado, I'd like to hand the mic over to Dr. Doddridge. Thank you. Thank you, Georgia. I very much appreciate the, uh, the, the warm introduction. And thank you to everyone for coming in on the morning of the last day of the conference. I'm sure you're pretty fatigued having long days, and it meant a lot to me that you would come and hear a little bit about the topic today, aerosols and black carbon in a changing climate. I also, before I start, want to give a uh, recognition to the people here at the US Center, who, especially those behind the scenes, the people you don't see that do a fabulous amount of work to keep uh, this uh, center functioning in a vibrant, an exciting manner and I d definitely want to give those people a shout out because without them, the people who get up and have the easy job just giving the talks, uh, it's, uh, it, it really wouldn't happen. So once again, thank you to you for uh, coming and attending. Also, any of you uh, watching uh, live streaming, especially if it's early in the morning in the US, I wanted to thank you for taking time out of your day to hear a bit about this topic. So. There's an inherent responsibility when you're representing the work of others to, number one, acknowledge them, and number two, not mess it up. So I'd like to gratefully acknowledge a uh, large amount of content from some really superb scientists uh, at, at universities and at uh, NASA centers uh, throughout the United States. Uh, these people uh, offered uh, of themselves, uh, their work and their thoughts that I was able to package into what I hope will be an interesting talk for you today. Um, saying that, uh, it's my responsibility to represent the work of others in a coherent and understandable fashion. And if I'm not successful in doing that, please blame me and not these outstanding scientists that you see listed here. It'll be my fault alone. So moving along, um, just to give you an outline of what I'm going to be speaking about today, I'm going to start with a very brief introduction to aerosols and their place in climate. I then want to talk a little bit, and we'll get a little bit technical, talking about the climate effects of aerosol and specifically black carbon. It's a poorly understood but very important factor in the whole climate equation with respect to aerosols. We'll discuss that a little bit. I'll show you some selected measurement examples showing you where these species come from, uh, what their abundance is in the atmosphere, and then talk a little bit about the global, mod uh, global climate modeling and, aerosol uh, and aerosols. Here's where we take the data, put them into global simulations, and try to tease out some of the subtle uh, ambiguities and nuances with the aerosols that contribute to climate variability and climate change. Some of them are counterintuitive, and that's why uh, the modeling at a global level gives us an, a much better understanding of this holistically. I'm going to show you some of these uh, selected modeling results uh, in, at a global scale, and then a quick summary slide of some closing thoughts. So on with the introduction. Uh, first of all, it's pertinent to uh, actually define the importance of 
climate in general and the Earth's energy balance. Climate forcing can be defined as the imposed perturbation of Earth's energy balance. What that means is that the energy from the sun that flows into the Earth comes mostly in the form of visible radiation, and that heats up the Earth. That energy can be re-radiated back out to space as long-wave radiation or heat. And it is the subtle interplay between that influx of energy and outflux of energy through the energy budget that's shown graphically below the narrative on this slide uh, that really the devil's in the details in understanding that energy balance um, as to what uh, components make up the total energy budget. The units that we use for radiative forcing are in watts per meter squared and some of the numbers for the various channels that we see here in the Earth's energy balance and radiation budget are shown in the, in the uh, schematic. I've circled in red areas of particular emphasis and importance to aerosols and I'm going to be looking at um, radiative forcing uh, associated with re uh, that reflected by clouds and aerosols into the atmosphere. Um, radiation that's absorbed by the atmosphere and radiation that's absorbed by clouds. And we'll be going through each of these in a very technical manner to try and, uh, I hope, give you uh, some uh, information as to the importance of aerosols in these areas. So why is it important to understand the Earth's radiation budget from a uh, weather and climate and even a policy perspective? We're running low on battery. I hope that means we're not going to die. Um, Ceres is a NASA, a series, Ceres is a series of NASA satellites that have been on orbit for several decades that look at the Earth's radiation budget from space. The left-hand panel is a, a plot of the net top of at atmosphere, TOA flux, in watts per meter squared as a function of latitude, where minus zero is the sign of the latitude for the southern pole, and plus one is the sign of, uh, sign plus one is the northern pole. And what you can see is, uh, marked in red as surplus, there is a surplus of top of atmosphere radiation in the equatorial zone. This makes sense because the tilt of the Earth doesn't tend to move the equator too far away from the sun as a function of the season. Whereas the North Pole and the South Pole will slant away from the Earth or to the Earth depending on the season of that particular hemisphere. So what we see is a surplus of TOA radiation at the poles and then that energy drops away, excuse me, at, it is a surplus at the uh, equator and that drops away at the poles. Jennifer Francis, if you happen to catch her talk earlier in the week, did a very nice job of explaining how this, uh, the radiation imbalance between the high and low latitudes, uh, actually res the response of the atmosphere to that is for wind and wind patterns to flow essentially downhill from the equator to the poles. This regional pattern of net radiation drives uh, along with the rotation of the Earth, drives the atmospheric and ocean, uh, oceanic circulations that you see in the right-hand uh, plot. So we see basically large-scale winds moving from the equator to the poles. Uh, now, where the problem comes is if there's a change in that balance or there is more imbalance, perturbations can affect this large-scale hemispheric flow from the equators to the poles. And this can have a very serious effect on our weather. So this is uh, global temperature affecting climate, which is affecting weather. And Jennifer Francis in her presentation, and also this was, I believe, streamed, so you can go back and look at it, talked about how the, the jet streams, basically the red arrows that you see, the westerlies uh, in the uh, uh, mid-temperate, uh, uh, mid-latitudes on the right-hand plot, uh, the jet streams in the North and South Pole have been pushed more poleward and slowed down, and this is actually creating more severe weather patterns uh, as a function of time in response to the, ch the warming of the planet and the changing of areas of warming. So, in a nutshell, it's very important to look holistically at the entire globe and how warming differences are affecting climate and weather. So now moving to aerosols specifically. 
Uh, by definition, if you look it up in a dictionary, you're probably going to see that an aerosol is a suspension of fine solid particles or liquid droplets within a gas, and of course the atmosphere is a gas. Aerosols have both anthropogenic and natural sources. Uh, anthropogenic sources uh, can be industrial emissions and motor vehicle emissions uh, that's for anthropogenic sources. For natural sources, uh, biomass burning, uh, such as forest fires, uh, de uh, deserts and dust that uh, are blown from desert areas, and also uh, sea salt that is generated from sea spray and sea foam. Soot is a subclass of aerosols that are the response of incomplete combustion of a hydrocarbon. So these are impure carbon particles that uh, result from burning. At the bottom of the slide, there's a couple, some representative examples of different kinds of aerosol. On the left, we have volcanic ash, uh, that which is basically spherical, but you can see there's a lot of morphology within the, uh, within the particle itself and lots of sites where um, gases and liquids can accumulate on the uh, volcanic ash and can lead to secondary chemistry reactions. Uh, the middle panel uh, shows sea salt. Sea salt can uh, vary in its uh, size from submicron uh, onto tens of, of around 10 microns in diameter. On the right hand side is tractor soot or uh, carbonaceous aerosol. Uh, tractor soot is an unusual aerosol because it's very amorphous. Uh, it uh, doesn't have a consistent shape and because of that and its uh, high refractive, uh, low refractive index, it is extraordinarily difficult to measure in remote means from space. And that is one of our challenges in understanding black carbon is it's very difficult to measure that from space. Speaking of measuring and interpret, whoops, try that again. That's not loading. There we go. Any of you that uh, were fortunate enough to uh, attend any of the hyperwall presentations uh, across the uh, corridor here at the US Center would have seen this global aerosol distribution. It's really quite a fascinating uh, rendition of simulated aerosol data globally. Um, as I said before, aerosols are solid or liquid particles suspended in an atmosphere. They can have a size range from a few nanometers, very, very small particles that are basically condensed from gases in the atmosphere, uh, ver uh, just a few uh, um, microns and uh, a few nanometers through what we call the accumulation mode from about 300 nanometers diameter up to about 800 nanometers diameter. These are the aerosols we can see. If we look out on the city and we see haze, those are the aerosols that we see in the so-called accumulation mode. Aerosols that are larger than about a micron are called the supermicron aerosols, and they are generally dust or sea salt particles. So we have a wide variety, not only of different chemical types, but also different microphysics, different refractive indexes, different scattering coefficients, depending on the size of the aerosol and the chemical makeup. Uh, the lifetime of uh, aerosols in the atmosphere can vary from days to weeks, and it dep depending on where that aerosol is, if it's near to the ground, or lower in the atmosphere where it can be rained out through clouds or gravitationally settled to the earth, it might have a lifetime of a couple of days. If aerosol can be lofted through convection or advection into the middle troposphere up s uh, several tens of thousands of feet, it can actually transport rather quickly through the high uh, wind speeds aloft and uh, can, uh, as, as is shown in this plot here, can actually travel uh, across uh, oceans from continent to continent. Uh, this uh, rendition that you see is a, uh, a GEOS-5 aerosol global simulation from the NASA Goddard Space Flight Center. Dust is shown in red and orange. Uh, green is organic carbonaceous aerosol, which includes uh, a representation of black carbon. And the white is sulfate aerosol, which mostly has industrial sources. And uh, finally, the... Uh, uh, blue is sea salt, and it's really quite fascinating. I could watch this image for uh, for hours. So specifically, back again to black carbon and talking about the sources. Black carbon aerosol sources uh, have uh, anthropogenic sources such as automobile exhaust, mostly diesel trucks, uh, industrial plants, coal burning, biofuel, and also agricultural fires, and also household fires. 
In nature, uh, black carbon aerosol sources are dominated by wildfires, but also there's some emissions from volcanoes. The dominant emissions of carbon, uh, black carbon are regional. Uh, throughout the globe, approximately one third of the black carbon emission budget is from wildfires. Uh, in the US, uh, the dominant source, about 50%, is through automobiles, through diesel emissions. And in Southeast Asia, uh, there's more of a mix, where biofuels for cooking represent about 25% of the emission budget, and industry about 20%. So we'll move on now to the climate effects of aerosols. Here's where it starts to get very technical, and I have to sort of go through this very slowly, because it's... It, some of it is counterintuitive, and aerosol can actually have warming and cooling effects depending on the situation. So I'm going to go through this and hopefully not confuse you along the way. Black carbon has a direct radiative forcing effect. Black carbon is black as it's operationally defined, and it absorbs solar energy and can re-radiate that energy locally where it's absorbed at infrared uh, wavelengths. So black carbon, whether it's embedded within a cloud or it's sitting on snow, will um, acquire solar radiation, absorb that solar radiation and warm its immediate environment. In that sense, black carbon uh, has a positive radiative forcing and contributes to warming. Sulfates, on the other hand, and other non-absorbing or scattering aerosols reflect the sun's radiation back to space or diffract it a little bit to another area. This generally causes cooling. The whiteness of clouds can be exasperated and increased by sulfate being embedded within that cloud, making that cloud more reflective and increasing the albedo, sending the incident solar radiation back into space without ever reaching the lower part of the Earth. So it can generally can cool the surface of the Earth. Now there's an also an indirect cooling effect of these scattering aerosols. Um, the sulfate and other small aerosols can modify the internal cloud radiative properties, affect the microphysics of a cloud in which these aerosols embed themselves within. What this is, it does, tends to do is to cause smaller <coughs> cloud droplets that suppress uh, precipitation. How clouds precipitate is that these cloud droplets are nucleated and then grow or aggregate to a size where gravitationally they become unstable within the cloud and they drop out as rain. You can stabilize that by certain aerosols being within the cloud and having more finer particles that are resilient to rain out. What this tends to do is have a longer lived cloud and increases cooling. And the caption you can see uh, at, the at the bottom of the right hand side there shows that the darker cloud that has the, th and that's not black carbon, that's just showing a darker cloud, that's a rain cloud, has larger droplets, less aerosols embedded within it, tends to uh, absorb the uh, rain out the uh, water and not reflect as much as the cloud on the right, which is whiter and longer lived and a more efficient reflector back of solar radiation. Black carbon can reduce clouds by what's called the so-called semi-direct effect. Now black carbon will absorb solar radiation and can heat the atmosphere in a layer where black carbon is present. On the right hand side there's a, sort of a cartoon showing um, some heat fluxes and evapotranspiration and the left hand panel uh, shows relative humidity and temperature as a function of altitude in a clear condition on the top and in a smoky condition, uh, condition or with black carbon present in the lower panel. And what you can see, I hope, is that uh, when you have black carbon in the lower panel, uh, the temperature actually increases. You can see it uh, uh, be warmer at uh, a loft than it is in the clear case and the relative humidity actually becomes uh, more sta stabilized and the black carbon reduces the relative humidity, lowers the relative humidity, increases the temperature. What that does is it forms a very effective barrier to evapotranspiration, which you can see on the right-hand panel, whereas in a clear condition you have these convective eddies 
that uh, move from the energy that comes from evapotranspiration up into a level where clouds can form, and you can see some small cumulus clouds forming. If you have a soot layer aloft, that can tend to, tends to dam or block the evapotranspiration, which is much smaller, and those heat eddies from getting to a height in the atmosphere where clouds can be created. Therefore, cloud formation is inhibited, so you're going to get fewer clouds with less solar reflectance and more warming. So it's kind of a double whammy. You've got heating aloft, so the area where the black carbon is is actually being heated locally, but you're also not producing clouds, and so you tend to have more warming near the surface. So once again, black carbon is a, is a strange animal because you can get counterintuitive effects. Uh, black carbon may actually invigorate uh, convection. Uh, there's, uh, in the uh, depiction uh, graphic you see, the, the top panel shows a growing, mature, and dissipating convective storm or thunderstorm or mesoscale convective storm, depending on uh, what discipline you study. The bottom, uh, that's in a relatively clear environment. The bottom panel shows that same storm evolving and forming in uh, a situation where there is more black carbon in the so-called planetary boundary layer. Now, how mesoscale convective storms and thunderstorms uh, develop is that they feed from energy close to the surface. That energy rises in a torrent, and the larger the convective updraft within that torrent, the higher the storm will go. And major mesoscale convective storms can get up to 50, 60,000 feet in altitude. Now, black carbon aerosol, if entrained into a developing thunderstorm, can act as nuclei for ice formation when caught in these convective updrafts within the core of the thunderstorm. When it does that and it gets freezing, the latent heat that was within that cloud is released. And that latent heat that's released adds to the heat flux that's already being entrained into the developing cloud. So you're adding a heat source through this freezing process nucleated around the black carbon. What this tends to do is to increase the precipitation because the cloud is bigger, it's more vigorous, you get more divergence aloft, you're going to get a larger cloud amount. You're actually going to also get more lightning. How lightning works in a cloud is you have small particles within these convective updrafts and there's also downdrafts that essentially have a friction between them. And that static that is caused by the friction between these particles moving at vertical velocities that can sometimes be 30 meters a second within these storms create static electricity that can build up and discharge as lightning. So these storms can become much stronger and more dynamic if black carbon is entrained into the storm. So it can increase the cloud amount and also increase cooling. Going now from cooling to warming to cooling again, black carbon, uh, excuse me, the other way around, from cooling to warming, black carbon on ice and snow is uh, a phenomenon that has been studied uh, very recently and is something that we really need to take into account in understanding the, uh, the global warming and aerosol issue. Snow and ice generally reflect sunlight, which cools the climate. Remember that you have the incident radiation solar wavelengths coming into the Earth. If the Earth has a highly reflective surface, then most of that visible radiation is going to be reflected straight back out to space, and you're not going to have a significant net cooling of the atmosphere as a result. Therefore, climate in polar and glacial regions is very sensitive to black carbon due to what's called the positive albedo feedback. If black carbon through transport, and remember black carbon under certain scenarios can have a transport lifetime of days to and longer and possibly leave a polluted source and uh, reach a sensitive um, snow and ice area. The black carbon uh, can deposit on snow or ice which makes the surface darker and would reflect less light. And there's a depiction panel on the right-hand side that shows darkening of snow cover. Now, if the surface becomes darker, immediately the albedo of that surface changes. And what was a brightly reflecting surface before now becomes a duller, more absorb uh, absorbing surface. 
So sunlight will be, and heat will be absorbed on that surface. Now that surface, once it gets warm, its natural response is going to be for the snow and ice to melt. Uh, harking back again to Jennifer Francis's excellent presentation earlier in the week, she talked about ice melt uh, in uh, polar regions and, and noted uh, quite succinctly that when ice melts, it actually lowers the uh, albedo. So melting ice has a lower albedo than, than fresh ice. It doesn't reflect as, as uh, efficiently. So once again, you're getting a double whammy. It's, it's warming because of the black carbon. It has black carbon impregnated on it. And the actual snow that's melting has less albedo than fresh snow. So you end up in this feedback loop where the snow and ice melt increasing makes the surface even darker. And if more black carbon deposits on it, you can end up getting into a cycle. Now, it's not a runaway cycle. It's more like a uh, snowballing effect, if you'll pardon the pun. So this is something that positive albedo feedback mechanism is something that until recently has been underappreciated. And we think it is a major driver uh, in these particularly sensitive polar regions. Aerosols also have a profound impact on monsoons. Over 60% of the world population live in Asian monsoon regions, and I've actually got a graphic on that coming up next. Monsoon-related droughts and floods and aerosols are two very severe environmental hazards with respect to Asian monsoon uh, regions. Now, the monsoon water cycle, like many atmospheric cycles, are driven by atmospheric heating and differential heating through the dynamical interaction of wind, moisture, clouds, and rainfall. And it's really all about the energy and the differential heating in different areas. Sea surface temperature and land surface processes can control the monsoon water cycle through generation of surface heating gradients. Once again, energy moving from a warm area to a cooler area and the atmospheric heat sources and sinks shifting. Now, suspended particles, aerosols, clouds, and precipitation in the atmosphere regulate and interact with these heat sources and sinks and can alter the monsoon water cycle. So globally, looking at monsoon climate systems, the climate system mon monsoons uh, globally are noted here in this graphic. And you can see there are several monsoon areas. The uh, thing to point out is that 60% of the world's population live in the Asian monsoon area. And this is a particularly sensitive area, and we've actually shown some simulations later on that look at the direct aerosol forcing in these regions is particularly strong. Uh, the other monsoonal areas, of course, uh, also are particularly sensitive, and have each suffered perturbations as a result of climate variability and climate change, although these are being studied. Some of these monsoon periods, uh, monsoon areas also exist in geographic locations where you get an interesting mix. If you could recall the uh, GEOS 5 simulation showing dust and carbonaceous aerosols in certain zones, uh, so for example, the Western African monsoon area is an interesting area because it has these carbonaceous uh, emissions as well as dust emissions and sulfate emissions all mixing in together. And uh, these can have uh, unusual and counterintuitive effects on the, uh, azen, uh, on the monsoon area. So now we'll move to some measurement examples. What we see here is, uh, once again, using the NASA uh, series uh, uh, radiative fluxes and clouds product from series and merging that with uh, NASA MODIS clouds and aerosols and looking at NOAA geostationary cloud observations. Putting the, all of these data sets together, one can get some estimates of the global all-sky aerosol direct radiative forcing from the top of the atmosphere to within the atmosphere and the surface. So we're actually looking at three slices of the atmosphere. And then you put these into a chemical transport model, global uh, model, such as the go-kart uh, model, which uh, 
uh, assimilates these aerosol products, you can look at these radiation forcings at different levels. So if one takes these data sets and puts them into the go-kart model, you can see that the warming and the top panel in the top of the atmosphere shows some global uh, heterogeneity, but averages out to be about minus 0.17 watts per meter at the top of the atmosphere. Now that's to be expected that it'd be rather small because you're at the top of the atmosphere. Now within the atmosphere, we have a two watt per meter squared net positive forcing. And this has a lot to do with the aerosols within this middle atmosphere. And you can see the so-called hot spots of that um, aerosol forcing in sort of the usual suspects of areas where there are large emissions of aerosols either through uh, land practices or industrial emissions. Moving closer to the surface, we can see that the net uh, radiative forcing is uh, cooling of 2.19 watts per meter square. Once again, seeing um, similar areas having that surface cooling, but a completely different effect. Remember that aerosols can warm the atmosphere and they can also cool the atmosphere. So once again, we're seeing this sort of counterintuitive where, you know, how can the, the same sort of species do two different things? Well, the devil's in the details and that's why the research is very important to understand the type of aerosol and uh, the morphology and chemistry of the aerosol as to what an effect it will have with respect to climate. So one way to do this, to look at aerosol uh, microphysics and morphology uh, more carefully, is to use some uh, research products that are currently on orbit in uh, using, the, in this case, it's uh, NASA satellite data. What we're doing is we're using the uh, French NASA partnership Calypso, which is a uh, on-orbit LIDAR in, in the A-train, and MODIS, which is an instrument on uh, the NASA, in this case, on the Aqua satellite, uh, Aqua satellite, which is within the A-train. Uh, some of you that caught the NASA presentations uh, across the, uh, the, the corridor here would know that uh, we actually have an afternoon constellation called an A-train. Uh, this is a sun-synchronous polar orbiting uh, procession of uh, satellites that uh, cross the equator at 1.30 every day in strict formation. Calypso and Aqua and Modus on Aqua are part of the A-Train and this is a, an excellent way to uh, look at data from two different satellites to try and understand uh, any particular species. So what we have here is we have slices from the Calypso LiDAR uh, superimposed on MODIS aerosol optical depth data product which you can see on the ground track and looking first of all at the Calypso slices one can see a lot of structure in, uh, in the altitude dimension in, in the Z dimension um, the clouds reflectances that you see are rather high in the slices are generally cirrus clouds these are clouds above 30,000 feet and uh, uh, Calypso is very sensitive to those. The blue that you see under these clouds is actually a shadow. Calypso is a uh, LIDAR, it's a laser. So some of these cirrus clouds, the LIDAR can penetrate, some they cannot. So you get a shadowing effect under these uh, clouds. Now where you have clear sky above the mid layers, you can see some yellow layers in the Calypso tracks. These are aerosol layers. You can also see some cloud layers at lower level. If one looks at the middle slice uh, towards the top of India, actually near the Tibetan um, escarpment, one can see a sort of hot spot of red. And you can see this not only in the Calypso swath, but also in the modus aerosol optical depth on which it is overlaid. What that is uh, are uh, aerosol emissions from the Indian subcontinent that through meteorological transport factors have been dammed up against the Himalayan plateau. And that shows that some of these transport patterns and uh, topography can cause some interesting features that we can see uh, with this kind of treatment. Now, is that relevant for climate? Probably not, but it helps us understand the source sink relationships that feed in on longer timescales uh, to uh, climate change. And uh, so this is a very powerful uh, method of looking at aerosols in near real time. The west coast of Africa is uh, an extraordinarily uh, prolific uh, source of dust. 
and this dust exports from the west coast of Africa over the Atlantic Ocean and can make it as far as the east coast of the United States and Mexico. And this, once again, is using Calypso data to look at a Saharan dust outbreak from the west coast of Africa as it propagates from August 7th uh, out to August 28th. And superimposed upon these swaths are actual uh, air parcel back trajectories. These are uh, mathematical model simulations of discrete air parcels that at some particular date arrived at the US. You can use meteorological data, archive meteorological data, to track that as sort of a forensic analysis, to track that air parcel back in time to see where it came from. So dust that is measured in uh, eastern Mexico and southeast United States uh, it can be, at a certain time, August 28th, can be tracked back through these red lines that link up remarkably well with the Calypso tracks back to uh, the source of this apparent uh, West Africa and the Sahara. And one can see that this transport is occurring at three kilometers above the sea level. Uh, and once again, the, the point to show this is that aerosols have a longer lifetime when they're higher up in the atmosphere. Closer to the surface, they're going to settle out gravitationally, and they're more prone to being rained out by uh, cloud events. So one can use uh, measured data and assimilate those into large global data sets to try and, over a long period of time, to look at trends in aerosol character globally. And this is the wonderful advantage of making long-term sustained internally consistent measurements from space. So what we see here in the, f in the top panel is uh, an aggregate of MODIS, MISER, and Aeronet data for 10 years over water total column trends. And uh, MODIS and MISER are on orbit instruments on NASA satellites. Aeronet is a global ground network of sun photometers, essentially mimicking what's being done at the uh, on the on the satellites, but looking from the ground up rather than the from space down. And the top panel shows the trend from 2000 to 2009, and the bottom panel shows the statistical significance of those data, with the cooler colors, the, the blue being a higher statistical significance and uh, the gray being a lower statistical significance. If one looks carefully at these data, you can see that uh, for most of the globe, uh, there is a statistically negligible global average over water in the aerosol optical depth or aerosol optical thickness trend. However, there are statistical uh, significant increases over three main areas, and if you go back to the top panel and look towards the right, uh, you can see over the Bay of Bengal, the East Asian coast, and the Arabian Sea, we not only have high degree of statistical significance, but we see a significant increase in the aerosol optical depth in those regions. Now, these are associated with emissions in uh, the Indian subcontinent, at Southeast Asia, and China. And so we can actually look at these trends over, over long periods of time to understand what the dominant aerosol sources are. We're trying continually to improve our uh, fidelity and representativeness of the aerosol uh, parameters that we derive from space. Now measuring something from 200, 300 nautical miles above the Earth has inherent challenges, especially when you, you're battling physics um, with using passive techniques um, where you're actually looking at reflected sunlight rather than actively pinging the atmosphere with a LIDAR, um, looking over several hundred kilometers can have its challenges. So uh, scientists at NASA and partners, uh, international and agency partners and the university community are continually looking at ways to improve the retrievals from these satellites. Here's one particular example. Uh, the Research Scanning Polarimeter, or RSP, is being developed for future missions such as the Aerosol Cloud Ecosystem, or ACE mission. Uh, what the Research Scanning Polarimeter will do is look at uh, size, size number distribution, uh, the, uh, the polarimetry uh, of uh, 
aerosols in the ambient atmosphere. And one way that these things are tested is that a uh, demonstration model for a satellite instrument is put on an aircraft and flown at high altitude along with some other long-time heritage aircraft measuring instruments and there's a so-called challenge to the satellite demonstrator. In this particular, we have two particular cases here. We're looking at uh, the spectral aerosol optical thickness on the left where RSP was actually flown with the Ames Airborne Tracking Sun Photometer, which is similar to the Aeronet uh, system on the ground that's been run for a long time, and this is an airborne instrument, uh, looking at spectral uh, aerosol optical thickness uh, over the Gulf of Mexico during Intex B Milagro several years ago. And on the right-hand panel, single scattering albedo, which is a measure of the uh, reflective and scattering capability of a particular aerosol, uh, where RSP is being uh, challenged by or compared with the Solar Spectral Flux Radiometer, SSFR, which is another heritage aircraft instrument. So by looking at the retrievals from RSP that one would hope to perform on orbit in a scenario where these instruments are co-located and flying on an aircraft and looking at the same scene below them is a good way to kind of tweak the, both develop the instrument and tweak the retrieval algorithms that are used to convert the radiances that one receives in the instrument into geophysical data that can be used to uh, inform scientists in the future. Another problem that uh, policymakers in urban industrial areas are very interested in is how to relate surface measurements of PM, particulate matter, uh, whether that's a PM 2.5 or PM 10, and try and relate that to the column above a surface site and understand the relationship between aerosol optical thickness and the surface measurement at 10 meters. So Daniel Jacob and his partners at uh, Harvard have used a model to try and get at this, to try and improve our algorithms that are being used to try and connect the dots between space, the intervening atmosphere, and the surface where you know, for the, we as humans really care about you know, what, what is being measured and what we're likely to see in, in the future and be able to forecast uh, aerosol events. So basically uh, what Daniel, Daniel and his group have, have done is taken airborne data shown on the right-hand panel of some key species that are actually important for biomass burning. And once again, some of these layers aloft uh, that travel long distances from biomass burning regions tend to impact regional air quality and climate. And there's kind of a missing source out there that we've been trying to identify. Daniel and his group have uh, considerable evidence to suggest that these elevated organic aerosol layers that include back black carbon as well as carbonaceous aerosols are a big piece of that missing uh, link. And uh, they're working using their Geos Chem simulations to try, and as shown on the left-hand panel, to try and emulate uh, w the observations that are being seen from the aircraft and try and use those data to improve retrieval algorithms in the future. Now I want to talk a little bit about global modeling. It's great to make all these fantastic measurements. It's, it's great to be able to uh, you know, get the best possible data. It's great to be able to sit and look at them on the hyper wall, but we want to put them in a form that can be used by the community and passed on to regulators and policymakers so they can make informed decisions using the best possible data. And a good way to do that on a global scale is to use a global scale climate model. For example, the Goddard Institute for Space Studies Model E uh, model. And this is described schematically here. It uh, basically encapsulates the Earth like, a, like the skin of an orange into a horizontal and a vertical grid, the number of spacings. Then what it does is in those, for those particular grid boxes, it uses a variety of input data. They include energy, water and carbon cycles, land, ocean, biosphere, and atmospheric dynamics, land use and land cover, and also atmospheric composition change. And you can't really see the schematic uh, 
too well at the bottom, but there's a, a cartoon of the different, these different cycles and how they, they feed into this global model. Now, these are extraordinarily complex models. They're very interactive. They nudge uh, and, and translate information between the grid boxes. They work at very high scales. But luckily, advances in computational power and, and, and memory. Now, the first gigabyte drive I ever bought 20 years ago was as big as a shoebox. Now you can, that was one gigabyte. Now you can put 30 gigabytes in a little tiny stick. So it's amazing how much storage has improved. And, and this computational power, neural networks, uh, cloud computing, it's really helping us with global modeling. Coming back again to black carbon, how do you consider black carbon in this model? Once again, I mentioned that, that black carbon has uh, warming and cooling characteristics. So this model needs to include the aerosol direct effect that is negative for aerosols and positive for black carbon. Looking at the absorbing and scattering of light by aerosols, where they warm the atmosphere and the stronger absorption by black carbon. The aerosol indirect effect, which is negative for aerosols and black carbon, it tends to cool. Aerosols act as cloud condensation nuclei, change the cloud cover, change the brightness, change their lifetime. The aerosol semi-direct effect, that could be positive or negative for the aerosols of black carbon because the presence of aerosols changes the thermal structure within the atmosphere and you can change clouds depending on the specific situation. And then the aerosol uh, snow darkening effect, which is positive when black carbon is laid on a highly reflecting surface. One can look at these as being the direct effect and the indirect and snow darkening effects being feedback effects that you need to take account in a total effect, in a dynamic sense in, within a climate model or you're going to get the wrong answer. Or even worse, you might get the right answer with one simulation and then you try and use that again because you're confident that it works in another situation and it doesn't work. Because if you get the right answer for the wrong reason, it really ruins the utility of your model. So this isn't easy, and that's why it's definitely a research problem, and uh, there are a lot of people out there in the community globally trying to improve these models and their representation of aerosols to try and get the right answer for the right reason. Now quickly, some model results. Uh, direct forcings per emission sector since 1850 is listed here in the domestic center, uh, North America, Europe and Asia use very different technologies. Uh, Europe tends to be SO2 rich. Uh, Asia is more black carbon rich. In the transportation sector, the strongest signal is in the US, followed by Europe and India. And you can see that uh, hopefully in these the hotspots represented by this uh, image. Model simulations can really help us, once again, if we get the right answer for the right reason, we can use them for future predictions. So one can take uh, black carbon emission fluxes and regional deposition and try and forecast those out into the future. Emissions are expected to increase in the near future, from 2010 to 2030, which one would expect to lead to increased black carbon, which would have a impact in some of these sensitive areas, such as the snow areas uh, in the Himalayas and in the polar regions. Future black carbon emission fluxes are predicted to decrease after 2030, as shown in the uh, plots above, for a number of the uh, RCPs, or so-called representative concentration pathways. That should lead to decreased black carbon deposition in Greenland, Himalayas, and the Antarctic. Once again, these polar uh, regions are very sensitive to climate change, very sensitive to black carbon. You, one can exasperate the already high uh, uh, temperature anomaly or heating in these areas by black carbon. So black carbon and climate in the future, there have been some simulations done that look at if we are successful in reducing emissions of black carbon aerosols, uh, due to recognition of the climate effects and also the health effects that I haven't talked about. That's a whole nother talk that I could give another time. What happens? How is the Earth going to respond to us reducing these in the future? So here's a number of simulations uh, done that show the response of uh, direct aerosol 
radiative forcing or DARF, D-A-R-F, for black carbon plus organic aerosols. The top panel shows what the expected uh, change in the aerosol forcing would be if there were stronger black carbon reductions in 2030 and 20, uh, 2100, and the lower panel if there were weaker black carbon reductions in 2030 and 2100. And the, the simple mes take home message from this is that we, we, we expect to see cooling. As we reduce black carbon, we should, since black carbon is predominantly a warmer than the atmosphere, we should see cooling. The cooling will be, uh, and, and once again, this depends on the emission control strategy and that, that globally that we are all in this together and do this in a unified manner. We expect most of the uh, changes to be in areas where there are most emissions, and that makes sense. Uh, we actually still see some warming in the 2030 weaker black carbon reduction scenario. But in all other scenarios, we see significant cooling as a result of these, uh, uh, cl this cleanup effort. So my final slide, and let's get this movie going if it'll work. There it is. Some final summary thoughts. Black carbon aerosols absorb solar radiation. The climate warming that uh, is a result of this can offset the cooling from scattering aerosols, those that are dominated by sulfate. The warming effect of black carbon has been recently demonstrated by Tammy Bond to be second only to the warming of CO2, which is, which is a result that surprised a lot of people. It has about 70% of the warming potential of CO2, so it's, it's, a, it's a player. Targeted reductions, for example, diesel fuel exhaust, which the US has taken positive steps to do, may cool climate and mitigate future greenhouse gas warming. But a cautionary note that the potential for climate warming mitigation may be tempered or enhanced due to these complex interactions that I hope I've been able to give you a feel for between black carbon, snow, and clouds. It's a very dynamic environment, and some of the feedbacks are counterintuitive, and the same thing can do different things in different scenarios. So we need to understand this, and uh, but I think the payoffs can be very rewarding. In closing, I'd like to thank you so much for your time. Uh, it's really been a pleasure to be here. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Bruce. Um, and at this point, we'll be taking questions. Do we have any from the audience right now? Yes. Can you please give your name and your affiliation? Uh, Constantin Abordi, the Apt Associates in the US. Um, you just mentioned in passing uh, the, the, the health impact. Mm -hmm. And since temperature and uh, aerosols and everything else may be difficult to connect to economic impact, health. Uh, impact is easy, you know. We can see it, yeah. Mm. So c can you speak very briefly on that and I if there's any more compelling or more convincing case uh, to connect, to do the correlation with the health benefit? Um, I, I, it'd be my pleasure. Um, the health, I actually did have some health effects slides um, that my colleagues had passed on to me and it's in the interest of time, I couldn't put them in. I'm actually in an air pollution meteorologist by trade and, and I'm, it, I'm actually more expert in that than I, than I am in this. Uh, black carbon is very interesting because uh, it uh, can affect health in several ways. Uh, it is of a similar size that can um, be considered a respirable uh, uh, aerosol. So we breathe in black carbon. Uh, now, just straight um, soot, uh, if it's just pure graphitic carbon, well, m maybe it's not an issue. But, but from some more exotic burning or black carbon being a site on which other chemicals in the ambient atmosphere that aren't quite so uh, innocuous, uh, such as uh, PAHs, um, polyatomic hydrocarbons are, are often co-elute with black carbon. You can get coatings on black carbon that when uh, are breathed in can cause uh, morbidity and mortality in humans. That's really not well understood. So uh, black carbon uh, certainly as far as uh, respiration is concerned I think has a uh, effect on health. Um, it also doesn't look very pretty. 
<laughs> it's, I know that's not a health impact, but, but you know, the moment you look around, you can see uh, the black carbon, uh, it's kind of messy to have. I think that certainly the, the respiration uh, of black carbon, ingesting it through, through the lungs, and some of the coatings that you can get on some of the, some of the soot can have chemical constituents uh, with it uh, that can cause cancer and uh, affect human health. So um, that is something I think is, is very important and, and the health aspects cannot be underemphasized. So it, there's additional benefits, certainly, to regulating uh, black carbon or, ca or in fact, uh, carbonaceous aerosols in general uh, because there's a definitely a mix of different exotic compounds that some of which can be quite dangerous to humans. So thank you for bringing it up. That's an important point that, that I wasn't able to make. Thank you. Great. Uh, do we have any other questions from the audience? Um, we actually do have a web question, okay. so thanks for giving a shout out to the web audience because I forgot that earlier. No, I'm glad that <laughs> um, The question was about biochar and cooking mm -hmm. and what kind of mitigation um, for black carbon we can see if we replace um, fuel with biochar. Right, well in principle, uh, biochar, and I, I'm, I'm not, I must profess not to be very up to date with uh, uh, the latest research on biochar. But actually at NASA Langley Research Center, we have a small group that are doing controlled burns of biochar right now. Uh, they're very interested in sustainability and looking at that. The bottom line is the sort of the holy grail for biochar is to get absolute complete combustion. And if you, if you could burn biochar, hopefully you should be left with carbon dioxide and water. And uh, I think the, the key is going to be that having the technology in place at the incineration end and, and, and having the right kind of architecture of the vessel that's going to burn the biochar to get the energy you need, but to have the right air fuel ratio to maximize the stoichiometry of the, the chemistry of the reaction so that you get clean products. Because in principle, biochar should be able to burn completely clean. and. Uh, I know there's research being done, done by this in, in Europe and the, and the US, and I think it looks promising, and certainly it can be very powerful if it's done. Now, I may or may not have answered the question, but I, I'm glad someone asked that, because I think that's, that's a step that really translates globally if the technologies, especially if they're, they're and it's probably going to be a simple technology to burn biochar, and if you make it available globally, it can make an incredible, contribution to minimizing those black carbon. I mean, I talked about the US efforts to uh, reduce black carbon emissions from, from diesel uh, emissions, but globally, the biochar can solve, uh, what solve, can address uh, a number of problems in developing countries where they routinely, you know, burn over, uh, cook over open flames. So thank you for the question. Okay, um, I think we'll take two at the same time. So go ahead and state your question. A small question. Uh, do you I'm not so good from Thailand. Do you mind to uh, tune up my understanding about the effect of the sulfate? Uh, it seems to me that from your presentation, sulfate is good to the global. Uh, it's, well, <laughs> it, it, it's good in that, I can answer this very quickly. It, the good part of it is its radiated properties are, it's, it's highly reflective. It has a very high uh, single scattering API dose. So what it will do is it will reflect out to space. The bad news is that when it mixes with water, it produces sulfuric acid and is a component of acid rain. So like most things in nature, there's always a trade. Thank you for that question. It's a All good right. question. So your name and affiliation, please. Hello, it's Chris for World Preservation Foundation. Uh, with regard to a lot of the black carbons, obviously from the wildfire, biomass burning, pasture burning, and curing, um, just with regard to uh, something as nit nitrous oxide, NPO, the UN just brought out a new report about that. A lot, uh, a lot of the emissions of that are also agricultural and from mm -hmm. the same sources mm -hmm. as the black carbon. Um, they've proposed a couple of different potential mitigation strategies. One of those was um, reducing meat consumption. Um, I was wondering if that's a possible uh, being looked at as a mitigation strategy for regarding black carbon as well. You know, I'm 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 just a dumb chemist, so I, I kind of more on the uh, on the science side. I, I am not aware of that now. Certainly, nitrous oxide. You bring that up. It's very 
important. Not so much in the troposphere, though, because it's got such a long lifetime. Really not until it gets into the stratosphere that it, it starts uh, adding nitrogen to the stratosphere, which causes whole other problems. I'm afraid I really can't answer your question because I'm not up to date with that research. So uh, I, there's probably uh, lessons learned and synergies there. I'm just not aware of them. I'm sorry. Any other questions for Dr. Doddridge? Okay. Well, I think you'll be hanging around. Um, he'll be around for a while. He'll be around. I think you're also giving a talk in the 30 minutes. Uh, over my colleague is, oh, is Cynthia, giving a talk. Yeah, okay. yeah, uh, <laughs> Cynthia wants to stand up. Um, that cool graphic that you saw from Bruce's yep. presentation will actually be we'll put, it up. Put, it up, put up on the hyper wall for you to see in great detail. So I, I, I encourage you to go over and see that. And for our web audience, if you aren't in person in Warsaw, I believe they also have that available on earthobservatory.nasa.gov. That's so you can right. find yes. more information there as well. Um, I'd like to thank you again for coming to the U.S. Center to our last event, and I hope to see you all again in, uh, in Lima next year. So take care of everybody. Thank you.